It's been described as the second coming of Kwesi Apia. Yes, former Black Stars defender Kwes, James Kwesi Apia has been named Ghana's 43rd national team coach. He beat two other contenders for the Black Stars job, Frenchman Willy Tanyol and Cameroon's African Nations Cup winning coach Hugo Bruce. This will be the second time coach Kwesi Apia will be taking the job. His first spell was in 2012 when he took the team to the 2014 FIFA World Cup, which proved to be rather disappointing and disastrous for some. Despite all that, he was still seen as the favorite for the job, with most people arguing that since the expert coaches have all failed to bring any laurels to the country, we may as well give a local the chance. Ghana Football Association President Kwesi Nyantechi, however, says coach Apia was not selected for nationalistic reasons, but because he ticked all the boxes for the panel. Kwesi Apia was chosen because he scored the highest marks on the score sheets of all the interviewees who took part in the selection process. Uh, he got the highest marks and so he got the highest average mark and that ranked him first among the three people who were interviewed. We heard rumors. Do you care about, you know, just responding to them that there was pressure from Ghanaians and also even some members of um, the new government trying to get a local man by force to lead the Black Stars? Uh, well, I haven't heard that, but I can confirm to you that Kasia Pia was chosen on merit. He was not chosen because he's a Ghanaian. Out of the three people who were interviewed, in fact, out of the 95 people who applied, uh, and later the three people who were interviewed, we thought he was the best. Uh, he was the best. So he won on merit, not because he's our countryman. Have you streamlined things for him now with respect to um, his tenure? How long will he be in charge? What should be his immediate target and all that? Has that been um, put into consideration? Yeah, we decided that we're going to offer him an initial term of two years, renewable. And uh, he'll start work uh, on the 1st of May. And also, in terms of the benchmarks, we will discuss with him. We already know what we want, and so we're going to sit down and discuss with him and find out if he has any difficulty in achieving those uh, targets that we're going to set with him. And if he has any personal targets he wants to share with us, we'll consider that. And then all of these will be reduced into the contract. And then we, we take off immediately. If there are any you know, mistakes he did during his um, first tenure, what would you like to see him correct as he takes charge of um, the Black Stars for a second time? Of course, we are all human and nobody is perfect. And so. In the course of his work in his first tenure as coach, he may have made one or two mistakes, but I believe that we all improve with time and uh, with the benefit of the experience that he has gained since 2014 when he left. He's a better person now and I think he will do a better job than when he previously was a coach. You know, how would he you know, work like when um, two of our executive committee members were on, on the record to have opposed his coming. Who are they? Um, because I, Kojo Yanka himself, and then we further say, we further say, yeah. They all denied. No, you, 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 if you just Google, you can get a quote attributed well, to them. Well, I just wanted to be sure. I asked them. Googling is one thing, and confronting the person is another thing. So they denied it. They denied it in the in the presence of the executive committee because uh, it's untenable, it's unprofessional for a member of the committee to go to the media ahead of a search committee whose report was yet to be received by the committee, the executive committee. And so any search conduct would have been prejudicial to the work of the search committee and we didn't take kindly to that. And unfortunately, uh, those things were denied, so we just leave them as such. And, and move on. Finally from me, is he coming in with his own backroom staff or you're just going to reject the whole technical team again? You mean he's bringing people from Sudan or where? No, oh, it, <laughs> it can be from anywhere. I mean, since he's been given a job. No, we are the appointing authority. We will appoint him and appoint whoever he's going to work with. But there's nothing wrong with uh, the coach recommending people for appointment to certain positions. We are mean. But what's in the name? Kwesi Apia, Joy Sports Benedict Ousu put together this profile of him. Kwesi Apia was born on June 30, 1960, and was a former Asante Kotoko defender 
and for the senior national team, the Black Stars. He played for Kotoko between 1983 and 1993, and for the Black Stars between 1987 and 1992. In 2007, he was named assistant coach to Claude Laura shortly before Milovan Ravaj was also appointed as his next boss. He also served under another Serbian coach, Goran Stevanovic. Apia was coach of Ghana under 23 and led them to win a historic 2011 All Africa Games gold medal. The following year, he was appointed substantive coach of the Black Stars and led Ghana to the semi finals of the 2013 Africa Cup of Nations in South Africa. Apia made history by becoming the first black African coach to qualify Ghana to the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. Ahead of the 2014 FIFA World Cup Finals, he received technical training from English clubs Manchester City and Liverpool. He was given a new two-year contract in May 2014, but left his position as by mutual consent in September 2014. He was later appointed head coach of Sudanese club Al Hatoum in December 2014. Right, so joining me in the studio now is uh, Joy Sports Anchor, and uh, he's uh, Joy Pr News Prime Anchor <laughs> as well, segment anchor, uh, Gary Al Smith. Hello, Gary. Hi, hello, Israel. Now, we, this hasn't come as a surprise to many. I mean, we've known for quite a while now that he was, uh, you know, the favorite to win, to take, up, to, 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 to take the job, and it's come through that uh, he's, he's picked the job. What are some of the reactions we're getting? Well, um, the reactions are very interesting, that even before he got the job, in that interview Redwan had with Christine Yantichi, at the tail end, you, you notice Redwan asked about the relationship certain GFA officials are going to have with Chris Yapia. Yes. Now, the story behind that is that the vice chairman of the Black Stars Management Committee, which is the man, the second most powerful man in the Black Stars Management Committee, his name is Wilfred Osei, yes. had said that he feels that Chris Yapia is not the best man for the job. So He's made a U-turn, hasn't he? Yes, he has made a U-turn, but it raises questions about well, if the second most powerful person in the Black Stars Management Committee did not at any point feel that Chris Yapia was the best man, how then are they going to work? Right. Well, he's made a U-turn, so that is it. In terms of media reaction, it's split. There are those who feel that Chris Yapia's, the reasons why he was sacked in 2014 are not reasons that he has done well over the intervening period to throw away. Meaning that, why was he sacked? A lot of people felt that he was incompetent, incompetent in the sense that he was not having control over the team from a tactical point of view. The people felt that his substitutions were not good enough. Others felt that his reading of the game were not good. And in the intervening period, he's coached just one team in Sudan. He's led them to the fifth position, and he has won coach of the year. However, and I wish we could get that interview now, but we are working on it. Uh, we spoke to a Sudanese journalist in Sudan on Joy FM, and he said that the reason why people are not confident in Chris Yapia in Sudan is that when he came from Ghana, they felt that they had gotten somebody who had gone to the World Cup. And so he was coaching a team called Al Hatoum. Now, in Sudan, there are two big teams. They are Hatem Kotoko, for example, Al Merik and Al Hilal. These two teams have dominated Sudanese football forever. So Al Hatoum had a lot of money and decided that we need a big name coach who will upset the established order. Unfortunately, Chris Yapia was unable to do that. So I asked the Sudanese journalist why. And he said that they felt Chris Yapia was only able to beat the small teams, but he couldn't beat the, beat the big teams. And for a lot of people who are watching, they would remember that that was a similar complaint people had about Chris Yapia when he was in Ghana. All right, so that, this is for people who are not in favor of the appointment. Yeah. But how about those who are confident and uh, believe that that's the way to go? So. The biggest reason that for those who feel that he should be given a second chance is he should be given a second chance. Um, first of all, they feel that the system failed him. When you say the system failed him, in the 2014 World Cup, we, are, we all know what happened with the Jamafel Commission's report, which revealed the massive fiasco that happened behind the scenes that Kwesiapia really had no control over. The government promising several times to send money at a certain time, and the players subsequently becoming agitated and so doing whatever happened, the money flying, and so on and so forth. People feel that because of those reasons, he couldn't put his stamp on the team. And so he should be given a second chance to finish 
his unfinished business with the Black Stars. Okay. Where is uh, Coach Kwesi Apia at the moment? As we speak right now, he's currently on the field. He is coaching his team in the, in the last game that he'll be taking control of in the Sudanese League. After that, they are going to have a small get-together for him and he'll be in what's, Ghana. What's, his, what's been his reaction? Kwesi Apia, as usual, will not talk. Trust me on that. Do we know how much he's going to be paid? Well, our sister station, radio station in Shira FM in Kumasi say they've intercepted some information that says that Kwesi Apia will be given $35,000 a month. So apparently, what they are reporting is the GFA are sending that to the sponsors of the team, the GNPC, and also to the government to see if they are going to okay it. All right, now how does that compare with what uh, Coach Abraham Grant was getting? Abraham Grant was taking, from what we know, $50,000 a month. Um, well, I know the obvious question is why is Kwesi Apia going to take less? It's... Um, from what I know, it's a question of what was Abraham Grant bringing on board. He was a Champions League finalist. You know, he had a bigger profile than um, and so on and so on. But there are people who are going to argue that Abraham Grant had also not gone to a World Cup before. So if Kwesiapia has qualified us to a World Cup and he has gone to the semi-final of the AFCON, he also deserves 50000 but I don't want to get involved in that. All right, but anyway, I mean, that's yeah. $35,000 a month that he's Plus taking. Plus a house and a car. Okay, that's a whole lot more than <laughs> many people, many CEOs. Yeah, oh yeah. In this country, oh, so yeah. it should be fine, man. Uh, All right. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Thank Gary Osmith. But back. there'll be more, yeah. Gary yes, will be back uh, with a lot more analysis. On, on my on segment, we'll be speaking to a Sudanese who worked with Chris up here All right. and knows him a bit more. All right. Yeah, he'll okay. be at 820. Thank you very much, uh, Gary R. Smith, bringing us uh, those analysis uh, on the appointment of coach Chris Yapia as the 43rd national team coach of the Ghana Black Stars. We're taking a break on Joy News Prime at this point. We have more stories coming up. Uh, minority in Parliament is citing the impending increase in transport fares after government announced a reduction in taxes on petroleum products as indication, the much touted relief promise Ghanaians the Mirage. Welcome back to Join News Prime. Now, the minority in Parliament is predicting government's decision to remove taxes on utilities and petroleum products will not bring much relief to consumers. Parliament on Monday approved an amendment to the Energy Sector Levy Act that will see the price you pay for electricity and fuel reduced by between 3 and 5 percent. The move will cost government 308 million cities as a result of a reduction in the public lighting levy from 5 to 3 percent and the National Electrification Scheme levy from 5 to 2 percent. Deputy Minority Leader James Avejit, however, unconvinced and is questioning why transport fares are still going up in the light of these tax cuts. The uh, transport associations like GPRTU and those unions, they fix the, the, the fares. The government hasn't done that. What government can do is to go and appeal to them to ensure that they put in factors that will not increase the fare astronomically. What is the reason given by the increase in fares? They are saying that it's an accumulation of increase in what? Petroleum products and other factors. So my question is that if you are saying that you are reducing the duty that is a VAT on the petroleum product, what one expects is that this should result in a reduction in fuel prices, one, then it will go further to reduce the fares. So if you are reducing taxes, yet the fares, the lorry fares are increasing, your policy is making negative impact. That is the point I'm making, and it's simple. Minority spokesperson on energy, Adam Mutawakilu, says government should rather scrap the 17.5% tax on petroleum products if it wants consumers to enjoy relief. If I consume 150 units, at the end of the month, I'm expected to pay 216 Ghana cities. With this effect, I'll pay 206 Ghana cities. So the effect is just 10 cities. So you realize that it's not significant enough. As they claim that the electricity bill was so high that it is even more than the rent paid. I don't think this will reverse the situation. And therefore, consumers shouldn't expect any drastic reduction in their electricity bill. For industrial consumers, it is even insignificant. And that is why we're saying that they should tackle the VAT component in terms of non 
commercial consumers or the industrial consumers. Which is the 17.5%. They, they, they should take out the VAT. That will stimulate growth. Isn't that too much to us? 17.5% um, of the cost. I could remember on, on exactly when the then presidential candidate, now president, met GI. That is the industry, and said that he is going AGI. He is going to reduce the electricity rate significantly to stimulate production, which will translate to employment. So, if you now are the president, just take off the VAT, and that will enable them to stimulate production and translate to employment. So, in the next effect is that individual will not feel it at all. But MPP MP for Kede Ohemi Tinyase believes half a loaf is better than none. The colleagues on the minority side are always making noises for the good things that we are doing for which they did not do. Now, what is the game? You levied 17.5%, and we said 17.5% should go off. After all, when you put in the levy, they never made us to know how much they realized and what it was used for. Now we feel the levy is having an adverse impact on the activities of the airline industry. So it has to go. What is the game there? This is, this is a, a good step towards a good purpose. Uh, whatever it is, have a load is better than none. It is good to reduce by a persona rather than to let it remain like that. Whoever will give you a help, start small and move forward better. So whatever it is, it is a step in the right direction. Why didn't they do that at their time? All right, so we'll have more coming to you from Parliament. But right now, we're going over to the Flagstaff House, where President Kufuado has just sworn in four new ministers of state, and he's addressing them. Let's go and join the feed now. Absolutely essential for the health of our educational system and thereby the health of our nation. That is why I have also carried on with this tradition. I've been particularly blessed in being able to invite to that responsibility an accomplished academician with a wide range of achievements who is a popular figure in our country and in whom I have absolute confidence. I'm happy to be able to appoint Professor Kwesiyanka to the post of Minister of State responsible for tertiary education. And I know that he will give his full support to the Minister for Education, the Honorable Member of Parliament for Menchia, Dr. Matthew Poko Prempe. By the same token, I think it necessary to strengthen the Ministry of Agriculture. It is obvious that a successful agricultural sector makes for a successful economy. Unfortunately, it is a sector that has recently been in systematic decline. And an, an energetic, knowledgeable minister has been appointed to mastermind its revival. He is supported by dynamic deputy ministers who are also knowledgeable in their various fields. The missing link is the presence at the center of the ministry of an experienced, politically astute administrator of the agricultural sector who can complement the work of the minister. Dr. Jile Nura, a former respected chief director of the Ministry of Agriculture, fits the bill superbly. I'm very happy to have him on, on board as Minister of State for Agriculture. I think we would all agree that one of the most controversial and perhaps the most costly of our public engagements of the last few years has been the administration of our, pub, of our law of public procurement. There are strong grounds for the proposition that it has been much abused a law that has been adhered to more in the breach than in its performance and than in its observance. It has been established elsewhere that a person of ministerial rank with oversight responsibility for the operations of the procurement law can help ensure 
not only its observance, but also its effectiveness. It is not the minister's business to interfere in the administration of the law, but to keep the president fully briefed of its workings. We want to ensure that sole sourcing is confined to the exceptional circumstances provided for in the law, and that, a com that competitive bidding is the normal principle of all public transactions. I have chosen one of the rising young stars of our political firmament, who has a deep acquaintance with procurement issues, to, to handle this important assignment. Fortunately for me, she is not just a pretty face. Honorable Ajua Safu, I know, will do a yeoman's, I should say, young woman's job. And I'm, she's very welcome aboard the Akufuado team. The quartet of ministers of state is completed by the presence of another dynamic personality whose duties in the office of the president will be purely political. A very successful young entrepreneur with a bold and original mind, I'm confident that the honorable member for Abitifi, Brian Achampo, is going to be a valuable addition to the team that is going to help me succeed to the benefit and welfare of the Ghanaian people. I'm certain that all four persons will be good team players who will respect the collective commitment we in the MPP have made to provide honest, competent government for the people of Ghana. The people of Ghana deserve no less. Congratulations to each one of you, and may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. Right, so that was uh, President Akufuado swearing in or speaking, there, addressing uh, four ministers of state who were sworn in uh, just a short while ago. We're returning to uh, the rest of our stories and to Parliament, where Majority Leader Oseche Mensah who says the Bank of Ghana should be held responsible for its gross negligence that led to the microfinance scam in the Brown Hapu region last year. He says the scam that led to the bust of DKM and other financial institutions was a result of institutional failure. Deputy Attorney General Joseph Penka is also calling for full-scale investigations into the incident. Parliament has Tuesday been discussing what can be done to avert such mishaps in the future. The conclusion of the House was that the Bank of Ghana had been negligent in the performance of their duties. Mr. Speaker, Article 183 of the Constitution is clear on what the Bank of Ghana should be doing. Article 1832 provides two, the Bank of Ghana shall promote and maintain the stability of the currency of Ghana and direct and regulate the currency system in the interest of the economic progress of Ghana. Speaker, when they came before us, they admitted, as the Deputy Minority Leader has uh, already stated, that the number of such bats was so huge that it was difficult for them to monitor their activities. The tragedy of it was that, even by their own admission, when they said the number was too huge, they were still in the process of issuing additional uh, new licenses. What does it mean? You are telling us that the number is too huge, you are not able to monitor. And yet you are pumping into the system further and additional licenses to allow other such schemes to operate. Completely mitigated. And you told the governor of the Bank of Ghana here, on the floor of this house, that he had been very negligent in the performance of his duties. Right, staying with Parliament, the Tourism Ministry has completed a safety audit at the Kintampo Waterfalls where 20 students were killed last month. 
Tourism Minister Catherine Yateku says lessons in the audit report will be shared with various sites across the country to avert similar recurrence. MP for Kintampo North, Felicia J, expressed worry about neglect of the site. Parliament on Tuesday discussed what led to the disaster and what should be done going forward. I'm happy to announce to this August House that as of last week, a safety audit and a team of experts visited the site. They've done their report and that kind of thorough safety audit will be shared across the nation wherever there is a tourist site. It is never too late. It's unfortunate we have to wait for 19 people to perish. But these are measures that we have put in place and it will be replicated. But I would need to assure the House that we cannot, we cannot use this tragedy has happened, but we cannot stop patronizing what God has given us. So after the audit, after the rehabilitation, after the renovation of these tourist sites, we will urge members of parliament, the 275 of us plus staff, to patronize our tourist site. There is the only way we can send a signal to the nation that Kintampo, once renovated, is open for business. We have to believe in what we have. But we can only do that when the necessary safety measures have been put in place. Catherine Yafeku subsequently hinted the committee has recommended making the Ghana Tourist Authority responsible for management of tourist sites rather than the current situation where that responsibility rests with the assemblies. Threatening to boycott academic work over recent mysterious deaths of four of your colleagues, they say, is making it impossible for them to concentrate. Examinations are due to begin tomorrow, but the students insist they are psychologically unprepared for the exercise. The death of the students or within two weeks, though away from campus, has caused panic among students and parents, even as authorities investigate the cause. Join News caught up with one of them in the following conversation, which has been muffled to protect the identity. I will bring you that interview later. Meanwhile, the Ashanti Region Students Representative Council is urging students of Kumasi Academy to return to the classroom as authorities investigate the deaths. The Ghana Education Service has deployed counselors and religious leaders to offer help to the students as investigations into the deaths continue. Coordinator of the Regional Students Body, Ralph Sarkodie, wants students to trust authorities to unravel the mystery. Um, Wednesday they are supposed to start exams for Form 1 and Form 2 and we, we are hoping that latest by Wednesday all the other parents should be able to bring their words over. And I think that for the media too, I have been very, very un unhappy about the way the media created panic and pandemonium over there in the school. That very night, the Friday night, you realize that a lot of media reportage indicated that the students were dying and all that. So for me, it was a sharp deviation from exactly what happened over there. And that's why parents rushed over there seeking to take their words home. And it was a deviation from or contrary to what was exactly what happened so I think that the media can help in this circumstance because if there's a parent who wants his ward to go over there to school he wants assurances that my ward will be safe and that I mean you went over there you saw that this, the situation is very calm everything is going on like nothing has happened and we are entreating parents that if the situation is under control regional director and the headmistress school authorities have done everything possible to ensure that students are safe in school and so parents should be rest assured and the pathologists are doing their work when they are done we'll know exactly what happen but for now everything is calm and we expect that parents will take their words back to school all right so let's hear from one of the students uh, who says they're psychologically unprepared for the exercise yeah i'm in class with one and i know his behavior he's always punctual in class he's self-disciplined and so far, he had never done anything bad. Yeah, like, like let's see, doing bad things, like as, as other people do in the school, no. But how do you feel as students? Are you afraid? Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Because I don't know when it will be my turn. Yeah, I'm afraid. They've not shown up what particular is going on. No post that this and this are going on, but 
You should be afraid. Why? You are in an institution where people are dying rampantly. Why shouldn't you be afraid? You should be. Yeah. The school is forcing us to write the exam. They are forcing us. They are trying in all their means to persuade the parents so that they would bring their words back into the school. But that's not right. All what they are doing is not fair. They should avoid lying that people are awkward and all those sort of stuff. They should come out with the truth and speak out the truth. For me, let me see, I'm not prepared because of what's happened. You see. So you had one of the students of uh, Kumasi Academy there, and that voice was muffled because they uh, want to protect his identity. In other news, get the children out of the street. That's a recommendation of NGO Child Rights International. After its one month of deprivation of streetism in four regional capitals, at a media briefing in Accra Tuesday, Executive Director of the NGO, Bright Apia, explained his team observed within the period that children are found, are found on the streets as early as 6 a.m. to either engage in trade or aid the blind to beg for alms instead of being in school. Bright Apia says this practice, though, has been ongoing for long, is not acceptable and must not be condoned as it defies the protocols of child protection Ghana has signed on to. Anodame has won the following report. Ghana has signed up to many treaties and protocols to protect the rights of children. However, the tenets of these protocols are not being adhered to. According to Bright Tapia, the lack of implementation and monitoring of these protocols over the years has resulted in many children found on the streets. He says the one-month observation revealed streetism has become the most widespread child protection issues in Ghana, a situation that should be a source of worry for authorities. You have moved from child protection to social protection where you are looking at the bigger family for the sake of, of the children. So we cannot also exclude the children from the parent. But if you want to do that, then it means that the state must create artificial family for these children, you know, which of course it also has its own legal issues and all that. He is particularly not happy that foreign nationals are confident to engage in the practice as well. For us, the option is for get them back to their various countries. That is our first option. But if the state is not ready to do that, or we cannot, by reason of war or something, we cannot send them back to their family. I think that we have to integrate them within our social protection net. Otherwise, uh, the life of these children will be in cycle. The only solution to this, according to Bright Tapia, is for agencies and ministries involved in child protection to ensure the laws barring the children from the streets are strictly adhered to. It's a commitment that we've made, and those com commitments are, they are, they are, they are unconditional. Once you have signed and ratified the UN Convention on the Right of the Child, it gives you a certain responsibility. If you have this number of children, it's an indictment of the protocol that we've signed. So if we feel that our social safety net is not so strong, you know, so it's, it raises a whole lot of issues as to whether indeed government is even aware of what is happening or whether they are ready to take steps. That is why we are bringing this to the force. For joining us, my name is Hannah Odame. Emergency health service is said to be on the verge of collapse in the Ashanti region as the majority of ambulance vehicles are said to be grounded. Only three of the 17 stations in the region are in operation with no sign of immediate intervention to rectify the anomaly. Sources say the situation is a reflection of the national picture, with reports suggesting only 35% of 100, the 161 ambulances in the country are active. Government in 2012 procured 161 ambulances at the cost of 10 million euros for the establishment of the National Ambulance Service. The ambulances, with a lifespan of five years, have not seen major replacement since. This means they easily break down on the road with high cost of maintaining them. Majority of them which have their engines broken down can only be replaced with their parts ordered from abroad. But this is something the National Ambulance Service cannot afford with the astonishing cost involved. At least 11 of the ambulances are currently parked at the workshop in Ejusso. 
Simon Skerra is the head of public relations at the ambulance service. Now, out of the 17 stations, only four are currently working. These ambulances you are seeing here have been supplied to us by the government in 2012. And then every ambulance has an expiring date. And because of the pressure on there, apart from the um, items inside the ambulance and the, the vehicle itself, you know, the pressure on ambulances, at least five years, it's not something you can, it can work effectively. So uh, since 2012 that we received these ambulances from the government, we haven't received any new ones. So we are operating with this and a lot of pressure is on them. You see these ambulances uh, getting breakdowns and everything. This can testify for us. You can see things for yourself. Um, we have about 10 ambulances being packed here for servicing. But when you look at the, the extent of damage, uh, extent of uh, damage or fault to these vehicles, it's not something we can just easily fix because most of them are engine problems. They are, all the 10 you see here have engine problems. means that we need total replacement. Only three stations, Konfanochi, New Adibiase and Manson Kwanta have ambulances in commission. This means three hospital emergency care provided by trained medics is absent for mostly trauma victims. Medics are worried they are unable to provide assistance to the number of people who made distress calls to their outface. One of them is this man whose voice has been muffled. The situation is very really bad, my brother. As a trained medic, you receive a stress call and you know what you are supposed to do. Somebody needs your service. You not being able to get the means to move to this particular place become stranded. And you feel as if you are not doing your work. And I know definitely if I'm able to get to this particular scene, one way or the other, I, I might be able to save this person's life. But here's the case, you have gotten to your limit. Mr. Keura, on behalf of the National Ambulance Service, is asking government to immediately come to the aid of the ambulance service. Now, the Media Coalition Against Kalamse is seeking a more drastic measure from government to deal with the menace of illegal mining in the country. At the launch of its advocacy campaign in Accra, the group is seeking, among others, a moratorium on alluvial mining in the country. Matilda Bamega has more. It is a campaign that has intensified over the last few weeks following shocking reports of massive destruction to water bodies and farmlands across the country due to illegal mining activities. Pressure has been mounting from various quarters on leaders to halt the fast-growing menace that is depleting natural resources of the country. A three-week ultimatum is currently under force to get all illegal miners to quit their activities or face the rigors of the law. With about 15 days to end this directive, a coalition comprising media organizations and concerned bodies have come together to fiercely fight against illegal mining to save the rest of the country's resources. A member of the steering committee to champion the media campaign, Kenneth Ashigbi, is calling for a moratorium on alluvial mining. In the times that we find ourselves in, when water is becoming a major problem, I think you need to consider the issue of a moratorium on alluvial mining. Yes. Be able to stop it and be able to stem it. Currently, you can't control it. Say that, let's hold for a while. Yes. Maybe it might be a, a year. Let me let's make sure we put plants in place, train our people well, yes. put the systems in place to check it. But Kenneth Ashby speaks of how they intend to sustain the media campaign. Okay. Well, so with the positive pressure, basically what we're going to do immediately is that with the petitions that we have uh, uh, outlined that we are going to get signed, we are going to go engaging most of these key stakeholders. When we go as well, one of the things that we would also do is that we would ask all of them to give us two, three, two things that they are going to do. So these are things that then we'll be able to get our media partners to also be able to follow through and say, we'll move to the MPs as well. We would uh, produce content that would show people who is doing what. Water and Sanitation Minister Kofi Ada, Lands Minister John Peter Mewu, and Minister of Information Mustafa Hamid also pledged to collaborate with other relevant ministries to ensure a reclamation process is undertaken to recover all ravaged lands due to the illegal mining activities. 
And what we have done recently in the ministry, since I assume office, is I put moratorium on all small scale licenses. And it's surprising to know that I have not signed any single small scale license since I assume of my things. This is an attempt to sanitize uh, the system. So this is the difference. Some of the small scale who are originally mandated within the regulatory framework by the concession to mine in a sustainable way are also not doing that. They are equally illicit miners. Implementing our own plans in terms of ensuring that the areas where we take the water from, particularly the immediate vicinity of the intake points from Ghana water, will be able to dredge, clear up that area, and make sure there's enough good quality water that we can draw up and then treat and distribute to uh, households and businesses. So we have our own plans that we're working on in terms of detailed designs and the work that has to be uh, undertaken to ensure that the water is available. If you take the Dabwasi area, the water that supplies uh, Signita Kradi, we are working on that. The Media Coalition Against Galamse includes the Multimedia Group Limited, the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, the Graphic Communications Group, GIBA, New Times Corporation, the Ghana Journalist Association, among others. For Joy News, Matilda Pumagam, Accra. 510 persons were killed in road accidents from January 2017 till date across Ghana. A total of 2,890 road accident cases were recorded within the period involving 4,822 vehicles, while 2,972 persons were injured at the same time. Director General of the Motor Transport and Traffic Department of the Ghana Police Service, GCOP, Maxwell Atingani, it is closed this at the official launch of the 2017 Easter Road Safety Campaign organized by the National Road Safety Commission at Fong Lorry Terminal in the Eastern Region. Maxwell Kudakos report. DCOP Maxwell at Ngani expressed the police administration's concern about the carnage on Ghana's roads, indicating his outfit's preparedness to confront the problem head on. According to him, the Ghana Police Service will deal with all acts of lawlessness on the road and ensure sanity. He said the MTTD will soon make emergency contact numbers available in most vehicle and vantage places for road users to call and complain about any act of road irregularities and careless driving for prompt action. The administration will deploy traffic personnel on accident-prone roads and highways, cities, to manage traffic and control, check over speeding, drain driving, reckless driving, overloading, among others. The police will also make available emergency numbers for passengers and pedestrians to report recalcitrant drivers that may endanger their lives. What we are saying here is that we will ensure that when you enter a vehicle and you want to travel, our numbers will be made available to you so that when there's anything during your journey, you can report the uh, conduct of your driver to ask for further action. Then the Chairman, Honorable Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, the police administration would also like to sound a strong warning that lawlessness on our roads will be dealt with in accordance with the laws of the land. Minister of Roads and Highways, Kwesia Mwakwata, indicated that every Ghanaian is equally responsible for the carnage being recorded on Ghana's roads. He personally accepted responsibility and assured Ghanaians of his ministry's commitment to improve on the road network across the country. He said a current road safety audit has identified many hazardous roads which will be fixed and made safe to ply. The Ministry of Roads and Highways has implemented a number of road accident mitigation measures to contribute to the efforts of addressing road safety issues in Ghana. This includes the development of road design standards with road safety engineering schemes to reduce the number and severity of road traffic crash situations on our roads. With engineers from all the three road agencies having been trained in the conduct of road safety audits. Now, the Upper West Region Police Command has hauled before it a young police lady who is alleged to have posted a no centric comments on her Facebook page. In the said post, having to do with the recent shooting, 
to the death of a 23-year-old teacher last Saturday, allegedly by a police officer. Lance Kofra believe Amejro used derogatory language to describe the people of the Upper West region. The Lance Kofra, who has been in the region since September 2012, was quizzed and a report sent to the Inspector General of Police for further action. The Upper West Regional Commander of the Ghana Police Service has meanwhile apologized to the people of the re region, especially residents of WA. When residents in the WA municipality told that the same intention that rocked the municipality following the alleged shooting of a 23-year-old teacher by a police constable, Francis Pingi, was going down, a young police lance corporal, believe Amazura, took to a Facebook wall and ruled I don't think the war fools will come to the police station and report of their missing motorbike. She got two responses from one Alassan, Abbas Ziad, saying that the post was unfortunate. She replied, I hate policing in a stupid town called Wa, proud to be a Bulgarian. Immediately after that, several people commented on that, using several invectives on her. The banter between the police lance couple did not stay on the social media platform alone. It became the subject of discussion wherever you see two or more persons standing or sitting in the war township. Some even went to the extent of asking the police administration to sack her. I do apologize for the loss in the audio there. We'll uh, work on the story and uh, bring it back. But in one other news item, a plan by the Public Services Workers Union to picket against management of TV3 Network Limited has hit a snag after the union was served with a court injunction restraining it from picketing at the precincts of TV3. Management of the media organization on February 28 dismissed 32 of its staff for engaging in various actions created a breach of the ethics and legal requirements regarding employer-employee relations. The former employees insist their dismissal was wrongful. There is more in this report. Come, come. So, so don't get it twisted. If you are seeing a singing and dancing and wondering what exactly is taking place here, these are persons who are not happy. It's not a case that they are celebrating. They are either pressing home demand. It all has to do with some 32 employees of TV3 that were dismissed. And these are workers here with the Public Services Workers Commission who are pressing on their demand. They maintain the workers were wrongfully dismissed. For which reason, as persons who belong to the Public Services Workers Union, they want all those 32 persons who have been dismissed. Reinstated. I will be engaging Mr. Ampabi, the General Secretary of the PSW, to explain to us what area exactly is this action that is taking place here, as well as what they intend to do next. So, actually, uh, in our plans, we were to pick it at the precincts of TV3, but unfortunately, we, as we were preparing yesterday to do take the action, we were served with injunction order, and we had to comply. That's why we, congreg we are congregating at this place to explain the issues to our members. So now that you've been served with an injunction, what is the next line of action? Well, among other things, also, Labor Commission has invited us tomorrow, 2 p.m. So we'll go to Labor Commission tomorrow, and hopefully they will also open the negotiations, which has gone still. But even before you decided to embark on this series of industrial actions, you may have been engaging the management of TV3. What have you been picking from them? Oh, no. They agreed to negotiate with us, but all of a sudden they take a U-turn to say that, no, the decision they've taken, they could not rescind it. And that's why, why we are also doing this. So, so do you still insist that it was wrongful dismissal? And what is the actual remedy that you are seeking in this action you are undertaking? No, the remedy we are seeking is unconditional reinstatement of the 32. When they had reinstated them and they want us to go into the matter, why not? But until that is done? Until that is done, they will never see peace. When you say they will never see peace, what do you mean? No, that's what, one of it is like this one. 
which they used last minute to put injunction on us, we are going to the court with a view of setting aside the injunction order. And when that injunction order is set aside, then of course we'll be free to do what we know doing best. I also engaged some of the dismissed workers who insist their dismissal was wrongful and they are asking that they be reinstated as soon as possible. Wrongful dismissal? Because as we are speaking, there's a regulation, there's a, there's a CBA, which is our constitution in the company. If you think I have put on red, and you are not happy about it, you give me a query. I'll respond to the query. If you are not happy about it, you need to investigate why I put on the red. So right now, what, what do you want done? For now, the case is with the mother, you know, the PSW, they are handling the case. So we are looking up to them. Whatever they come out with it, we will also follow it. But it's your hope that you'll be reinstated? If they reinstate us, fine, why not? Because I've not done anything wrong. And uh, they want the, the union, all the union executives, to, uh, to, 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 uh, they will sack all of them so that they can do whatever they like. Because the, the, the union don't allow them to do a certain things. So they don't want the union to be there. That's how I, I can see it. Otherwise, somebody who, who, who's in, uh, on leave will be give a summary dismissal letter. Clearly, the raging battle between the management of TV3 and the Public Services Workers' Union continues unabated. We will be monitoring this to tell you how it will pan out eventually. Reporting for Join News, Joseph Akable. Right, so we return to our earlier story on the Upper West Region Police Command hauling before it a young police lady who is alleged to have posted egocentric uh, comments on her Facebook page. The Lance Corporal, who has been in the region since uh, 2012, was quizzed and reports him to the Inspector General of Police for further action. Rafiq Salam has that report. When residents in the one municipality told that the same intention that rocked the municipality, following the alleged shooting of a 23-year-old teacher by a police constable, Francis Pingy, was going down. A young police lance corporal, Bleef Amazura, took to a Facebook wall and wrote, I don't think the war fools will come to the police station and report of their missing motorbike. She got two responses from one alassan, Abbas Ziad, saying that the post was unfortunate. She replied, I hate policing in a stupid town called Wa, proud to be a Voltarian. Immediately after that, several people commented on that, using several invectives on her. The banter between the police lance couple did not stay on the social media platform alone. It became the subject of discussion wherever you see two or more persons standing or sitting in the Wa township. Some even went to the extent of asking the police administration to sack her. Ghana and for everybody. I'm the commander if you are hearing this, the girl you must dismiss her. We are serious about that. She came and she was crawling, begging for houses. We stay together with them. We live together, we eat together. Why then should we uh, should you insult us? That you uh, uh, why is hell? What do you mean by why is hell? I think that the lady didn't do well as a, an officer of the law. She was supposed to take her time because these things that she is saying are likely to bring about conflicts because when people read, people react. So I think that she should be very careful and other um, people who are also talking too much about the issue should also be very careful with what they say. No, with the comments, including the natives and everybody, everybody integrity is at stake. I say, I would say Wala or Edegati in this region or Isisala, or any other tribe in this region. This is unfortunate comments, and the lady need to be reprimanded. These are unqualified policemen in the system. That is worrying us in this region. Sometimes they do things that doesn't show, uh, that, uh, that doesn't show that they're actually well trained. So the government or the authorities, be the regional commander, need to what? Reprimand the lady and put her to order. If possible, she'll be sacked. Meanwhile, the top hierarchy of the Upper West Command of the Ghana Police Service this morning met with Lance Corporal Amizuro to interrogate her 
on the alleged evidence-centric comments. She was interrogated for several hours and a sent to the Inspector General of the Ghana Police Service for action. Upper West Commander of the Ghana Police Service, ACP Buapia Ochre, described the comments as unfortunate and has apologized to the people of Wa. And on behalf of the Inspector General of Police, on behalf of the Police Command in the Upper West Region, we render our sincere apology for this unfortunate comments. The police woman is being investigated. She is being sent to the National Headquarters, Accra, for the necessary action to be taken by the Inspector General of Police. So once again, we extend our apology to the overlord of the Wala Traditional Council, the Chief Iman, the Tamdana, Catholic Bishop of Wa, and the entire residents of Wa municipality. Reporting for Dwayne News, Rafik Salam. Wow.